The Lord be with you. Of all the Old Testament uh, books, no one is quoted more in the New Testament than the prophet Isaiah. And the reason for that is he writes a lot about the coming Messiah. He sees the coming of Jesus. Um, He's inspired to see that, and so he writes about that. We're going to study Isaiah over the next four weeks of Advent, and, and that will give us a richer understanding of the one who was born in Bethlehem and the one who's coming again to take us home at the end of the age. Please stand. The Spirit and the church cry out, Come, Lord Jesus. All those who await his appearance pray, Come, Lord Jesus. The whole creation pleads, Come, Lord Jesus. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who led your people Israel by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Enlighten our darkness by the light of your Christ. May his word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. For you are merciful and you love your whole creation. And we, your creatures, glorify you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The Old Testament for the first week in Advent is from Isaiah chapter 40. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted, shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill shall be low. An uneven ground shall become level, and rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry, and I say, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Go on up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voices with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not, say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with recompense before him, comes with might, and his arms rule for him. Behold. His reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them up in his bosom and gently lead them, lead those that were with young. This is the end of the Old Testament. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. Holy Father. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 14th chapter. Let not your hearts be troubled, said Jesus. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to the, to the place where I am going. 
Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. We remain standing for the hymn. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for our pastors and teachers in Christ, for all servants of the church, and for all the people. Let us pray to the Lord. For our public servants, for the government and those who protect us, that they may be upheld and strengthened in every good deed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for those who work to bring peace, justice, health, and protection in this and every place. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for those who bring offerings, those who do good works in this congregation, those who toil, those who sing, and all the people here present who await from the Lord great and abundant mercy, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for favorable weather, for an abundance of the fruits of the earth, and for peaceful times, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for our deliverance from all affliction, wrath, danger, and need, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Diane Knack and Art Malker undergoing surgery next week, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For the faithful who have gone before us and are with Christ, let us give thanks to the Lord. Thanks, thanks be to God. God. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Rejoicing in the fellowship of all the saints, let us commend ourselves, one another, and our whole life to Christ our Lord. To you, O Lord, O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness. 
through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon text is from the Old Testament lesson. Comfort, comfort ye my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. The idea of home and, and homecoming is a powerful one. Your home is much more than just where you live. It's your sanctuary in a sorts, the place where you rest. It's the place where you can beyond, be beyond the reach of mean and unsmiling people. Home is where you are fed. It's where your bed is, your family room, your books, your, your music, your grandmother's quilt, the kitchen table. It's the place to which you retreat when you're too tired to work anymore. It's the place where you belong, where you feel safe, hopefully, and can relax and be yourself. When you're away from home, after a while, you grow homesick. Even if you're having a, a grand time on vacation, how nice it is to come home and crawl into your own bed. Also in scripture, Home and homesickness and homecoming, it's an important motif, a central theme that it, it just keeps coming up. You recall after Adam and Eve rebelled against God and fell into sin, they were escorted out of the garden, garden and never allowed to enter again. They became homeless and homesick. Later, the children of Ab Abraham became enslaved in, in Egypt, foreigners in a foreign land. Those slave barracks were anything but like home. And after the Lord brought them out, they, they wander homeless in the desert for 40 years, waiting, yearning for a homeland. Eventually, God gives them that land, the promised land, but because of their sin and their rebellion, they cannot hold on to it. They cannot remain there. That's when the worst thing that could happen to a nation happened to Judah and to God's people. It was six centuries before Christ. The armies of Judah were defeated and pushed all the way back to the capital city of Jerusalem by the superior forces of Babylon. The Babylonians laid siege on the city. That means they surrounded it and allowed nothing to come in or go out of the city. And finally, the city collapses. The city walls are breached. The city is overrun. And then, as always happens, the looting, the pillaging, the awful crimes against humanity. The Babylonians destroy much of the city, paying particular attention to the temple, the heart and soul of Judah, which they tear down into rubble stone by stone. Then, as was their custom with every nation they vanquished, the Babylonians assemble all the leading and important citizens of Judah, the business people, the artisans, the musicians, the priests and lawyers. They assemble all the leading citizens and march them all the way across the desert to Babylon, where they put them to work. It was a way of ensuring Judah would remain subdued and submissive for decades. It was also a way of building Babylonian commerce and culture and palaces. It's called the exile, and it lasted seven decades. A whole generation of God's people died, and another came of age in Babylon, and they longed for home told stories about how it used to be in sweet home Jerusalem. They sang songs about home. Most difficult of all was that in the separation from home, separation from the temple, they sensed a separation from God. They sensed they had lost their God. Or worse, that God had washed his hands of them that he had finally had it with this people and become fed up with them, so fed up that he cut himself off from the covenant and abandoned them. It was a time of deep sadness. 
One of the psalmists wrote, by the rivers of Babylon we sat down and there we wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars we hung our harps for there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of those songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. The only thing that kept these people from despair who were held captive in Babylon was the thought of home and the hope, faint as it may be, that God had not abandoned them that God re would rescue them and redeem them and bring them home. They began to see their redemption in terms of going home. And after 70 years of, of exile, it finally happens. God sees to it that the exiles are released. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins, meaning he'll bless them twice as much with good things to the punishment she deserved for her sin. They're going home. God has not forgotten them. God knows exactly where they are knows their names, knows what they need, has forgi forgiven them already, loves them still, and will richly bless them. They did nothing to deserve this. This redemption is an act of mercy without merit or worthiness on their part. But this prophecy of Isaiah sees farther than just the release of the captives in Babylon, it looks ahead to our release from captivity to sin through Jesus, his death on the cross. And it looks still further ahead to his return with great might to bring us home. You see, exile is more than just about, ge more than geographical. In many and various ways, we too are all living far from home. As sin barred Adam and Eve from the garden, and as sin barred God's ancient people from the promised land, so sin bars us from God. Sin separates us from God. Sin creates a distance between us and God. It creates an exile between us and God. And by nature, we're full of sin. That's who we are. That's what we do and think and say. That's what we fail to do and think and say. Here's the good news. God loves us nonetheless and desires that none should perish, not one. So he sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. Jesus, our all-powerful king, Jesus, our gentle shepherd, went to the cross to redeem us from sin. There he was crucified for us. That's how he released us from captivity from our exile. That's the way he chose to redeem us from sin and to earn for us eternal life. God has rescued us through his son, Jesus. But we're not yet home yet, are we? Can you feel it? Can you feel the occasional homesickness deep down in your soul? Sometimes it's faint. Sometimes it's a low burn homesickness, but at other times we long for our heavenly home almost with an edge of despair. When I, when I see people in the hospital, members, or at, at their homes, some of our own members start sounding like the prophets of old. How long, O oh Lord, how long? Why am I still here? Why don't you come and take me home? What's the purpose of keeping me here? They're, they're ready today. And they see no point in delay. They yearn to go home. We can see the same yearning in Psalm 42. As the deer pants for streams of flowing water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul 
thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? That's where some of our members are at. That's where you and I should be if only we knew what we miss. Exile is more than just geographical. There is or should be a bit of homesickness in us all. Many try to satisfy it by building their castle here on earth, stuffing it with fine things, but a, a hope and a homesickness placed in our hearts by God will not be satisfied with bricks and mortars and plumbing and electrical conduit. I think deep down we know God has something else in mind, something bigger, brighter, infinitely better. We're not there yet. Hebrews 11 says we are aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show they are longing for a better homeland, a heavenly one. And again from Philippians 3, our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, God invites us to see our redemption also in terms of going home. In, in our gospel lesson, Jesus said, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I'm going there to prepare a place, a home for you. And if I go, I will come back and take you to be with me where I am. So, if home is that place where you are sheltered and can finally rest, then heaven is your home. If home for you is a sanctuary for mean and unsmiling people, then heaven is your home. If home is where you are fed and refreshed and restored, then heaven is your home. If heaven is a place of, if home is a place of music and feasting and of friends, if home is a place where you're always welcomed, always loved, where you always belong, then heaven is your home. And the one hanged on the cross is the one who has already earned that home for you and has already given it to you. Jesus said, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. <coughs> Jesus is the one who will come again to rescue us from our exile and take us home. The strong saving news is that he loves the world so much that to never give up on it loves us so much as to be born into it and to die for it so that those created by God might return to God, where we know ourselves to be loved and welcomed, never forgotten, and ultimately fully safe, whole, peace, at peace, and at home. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. We stand for prayer. Lord God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending by paths yet untrodden through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Almighty and merciful God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen.